Okay, good morning. Good morning. Let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will get started here on um, our discourse. There is no one on this side. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, just for this morning. Thank you for this time. Pray, Lord, that uh, this would uh, just be instructive and productive. And um, overall, Lord, uh, you would be glorified in this. We thank you so much for it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, we are going through uh, Daniel chapter four. Um, this is part four or part five, depending on um, if you add the Enuma Elish or not, um, that particular discourse. So let's go ahead and uh, jump in here. Um, just to kind of review where we are in terms of our timeline, we are now possibly between 563 to 62 BC. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar um, is getting ready to pass away. And, um, uh, and uh, before he does this, he is marking essentially uh, something that God has done for him. Um, this is an important thing here. Uh, before this, in chapter 3, we were at 586 B.C., 20 years before, and that was possibly around the time that the uh, image of Marduk was built for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow down to and worship. So there's been quite a bit of time between that particular sequence of events and this one. Daniel, uh, at this time, uh, is probably about just about 60. Um, he was about 35 when um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, were tossed into the fiery furnace. So like I said, some time has passed between then and now. We often forget that too. Like sometimes when we read scripture and we see all these amazing things that happen, we tend to think that they probably happened in succession. Uh, but we forget that there's more than likely a huge amount of time that has passed between these things and these events. So uh, it's good to keep that in mind. Review from last week, Nebuchadnezzar detailed what occurred to him after the God of heaven gave him a dream. These things are occurring in consecutive order, in consecutive fashion. Concerning his perspective and the punishment that would occur according to his perspective. Um, this is not about this a personal pride that he has, although I would say that he probably has that to some degree, but this is not necessarily about that. This is not necessarily about the pride of Nebuchadnezzar, just him being boastful for boastful sake. But um, I'm convinced based upon some of the language here, and I'll even uh, point out a couple of things here that I think even makes this more clear, that this is a direct attack on Marduk that is the God of Babylon and who Nebuchadnezzar believes gave him the right to rule over Babylon. I believe this is why it's central focus, why his authority has been taken away, his ability to reason has been taken away, which essentially is authority to govern. And so uh, there you have it. Um, as I mentioned before, we, uh, we talked about again, the details of him um, losing his reason or his mind and end up uh, going into or out into the wilderness to eat grass like the beasts, right? Um, growing hair as long as eagle's feathers, nails about uh, as bird's claws. I mean, this, he was looking very haggard, right? And it wasn't for like a month or two months, but during a time of seven periods or seven long years, he was doing this. Now, again, I mentioned before that any person who saw Nebuchadnezzar in the state could very easily take over the kingdom. I mean, I, they could just come right in and just start delegating stuff, right? But God had told them that uh, he was going to preserve his kingdom and his rule, right, for seven years. So seven years, he has not had any threats, um, he has not had anybody try to usurp him, all because, again, of the word of God for Nebuchadnezzar to show him that it is the God of heaven who establishes these things and not Marduk. In chapter 4, verse 34, we will continue here and talk about some things. I don't think we'll, maybe we'll get beyond 
yeah, we probably won't get beyond this. Um, let's go ahead and read here. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, again, with this statement above, recalled the period of time that he would be in this position to conduct himself like an animal. So at the end of that period, that seven year period, again, it's a long time. Um, yeah, it's a long time, man. Um, again, this corresponds with uh, verses 32 in chapter four. Again, just as Daniel, by, um, by way of God, interpreted or explained this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. It says, you will be driven away from humankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Okay. Let's continue here. Um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, begins to detail what happened after he raised his eyes towards heaven, as you can see. The Aramaic phrase translated, I, Nebuchadnezzar, which is important. We can't skip past this. This underscores that this is his personal testimony. Again, if we were citizens of Babylon, this would be a big deal to us, right? Um, our king has detailed that he is the one who personally experienced this. And again, we are, as citizens of Babylon, we would recognize that Marduk is the one that has all the power. He's the one that controls all these things. He's the one that pulls the strings. He's the one that establishes and tears down kings. But we read that Nebuchadnezzar raised his eyes towards heaven and his reason returned to him. What does that tell you? That tells you that Marduk is a fraud, that he doesn't exist, right? He's not real. So his personal testimony matters to the people of Babylon and all the surrounding regions who know of Babylon's influence in Nebuchadnezzar. That his personal testimony concerning that period of time that this occurred and the actions that followed are his own. Again, this is the same phrase that is found in chapter four, verse one, or chapter four, verse four of this particular segment. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my palace. He even starts off in verse one, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of all the peoples, nations, and men of every language. Again, he is identifying himself as the person who has experienced this, right? which is underscored here. Let's look at this word reason for a second in the Aramaic phrase. It is manda. Uh, this word occurs four times in the scriptures here, and it only occurs here in the book of Daniel. I believe it's only in this chapter. Uh, the root word here comes from uh, the Hebrew word mada, meaning knowledge. Okay. So it is connected or associated with this word. And of course, it underscores knowledge, thought, or understanding. So it's not necessarily the fact that uh, it's not necessarily like reason in terms of how we understand the word, but it's more underscored. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's faculty or ability of gaining knowledge and comprehension. When we read things and we think about them, we simmer on them, right? We are using our ability or faculty of reason. When he makes decisions, he's making them using this ability or faculty of reason. This Now that his reason was taken from him, this is in contrast to an animal as much as you guys love your animals, notice the, the emphasis on you. They don't have reason like we do. Particularly wild beasts. Okay. 
which is why he was out uh, in the wilderness eating grass like cattle, because no human being would ever do this of their own admission or their own will. So at the end of that period, he raised his eyes toward heaven and his reason returned. That's kind of interesting. He didn't cry out and say, okay, you're, you're, you're God, I give, right? He didn't say, you know, okay, I quit, right? He just raised his eyes towards heaven. Why? He couldn't speak. He has no reason, right? He raised his eyes towards heaven. Nebuchadnezzar, again, likely does not have the means to speak, right? You need the faculties and abilities to have this understanding and, and respond in this way. So even, his, even the dialect that he's used to retrieving from his reason is gone, okay? Instead, he raises his eyes towards heaven. Nebuchadnezzar likely does not have the means to speak and acknowledge him because his knowledge or his reason is lost. He doesn't have it. Again, this also highlights the word of God concerning Nebuchadnezzar. Again, if we go back to that, uh, the details of the dream, this is exactly how this occurred. In the next statement here, he goes, and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. Fascinating to me. So right after he obtains his reason, his ability to think and comprehend, he automatically speaks. But this time he speaks not concerning his kingdom, not concerning Marduk, not concerning anything else, but the most high. I would presume after seven years, when you're able, when you're not able to talk, this is probably the first thing to do is to speak and praise the most high who has done this to him. Nebuchadnezzar said that he raised his eyes toward heaven. Again, uh, again, this highlights the word of God concerning Nebuchadnezzar. Let's look at the, uh, the Aramaic word here for blessed. The word for blessed is Barak. Uh, this word occurs five times here in the scriptures. And again, this word only occurs here in the book of Daniel. These three words are pretty interesting, particularly uh, from the perspective of Nebuchadnezzar in our discourse. This root word comes from the Hebrew word Barak, again, meaning to bless. Okay? It's not like, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is blessing God, like how we kind of use it. Right. He is speaking favorably of him. As a matter of fact, this word carries with it the actions of kneeling before a person and speaking favorably towards another. Right. So God. So Nebuchadnezzar begins to speak favorably towards the God of heaven, the most high. As a matter of fact, we see this kind of word Barak in Daniel 2. It says the mystery was revealed to Daniel in the night vision, and then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, that, let the name or the influence, the reputation of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power are his. They belong to him, right? The means of Daniel's statement underscores that he spoke favorably to God. Oops. We see this in Daniel also, chapter 3, verse 28, which is kind of interesting. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, or, or speak, speaking against the king's words, really, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own God. I find this fascinating that a chapter before uh, Nebuchadnezzar uses this phrase to speak of the God of them, right? This was before he was convinced that he was God, period, right? 
He's just one of many gods that are highly favored, I suppose. Praise. Let's take a look at this Aramaic phrase. Shabbat is the Aramaic word here. This word again occurs five times in the scriptures. It only occurs in the book of Daniel. This root word uh, comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, meaning to praise or to commend, um, to speak well of, reverential towards. This word carries with it to underscore the admiration and reverence of the subject who is being addressed. Also, this Aramaic word is always, when it occurs, is used in context of a deity to praise. Okay. So Nebuchadnezzar is speaking favorably towards the God of heaven, which he has done before, but he's done it with a different audience. Now he's doing it himself. He's also praised him, speaking of high reverence to God. What about the Aramaic phrase honored? Hadar is the Aramaic word here. This one occurs seven times in the scriptures, only in the book of Daniel. Okay. And it corresponds with the Hebrew word that is spelled the same way, Hadar. This word carries with it that it amplifies and recognizes one by their words and their speech. So if a person is honored, you know, they usually are uh, risen up, right? And people speak well of them, right? They are kind of in the spotlight, so to speak, with the words and the speech that a person is using to emphasize them. That's what honor means in this particular text. So he's speaking favorably of, um, of the God of heaven. He's, of course, commending him. And by his words, he is magnifying or highlighting him, which is pretty incredible. All of these words, these three words, blessed, honored, and praised, are written in the same stem, the PL stem. If you rec recall... This is similar to the stem in Hebrew and is intensive in nature and conveys a more concentrated action than just the verb itself, than just the root verb. So that tells us that after his reason returned, he was very intentional about acknowledging God and his work. In other words, he didn't think about it. He didn't just go, well, you know, maybe I should do this. Probably a good idea, right? Right when his reason returned, he hit the floor and began to speak well of the God of heaven. Let's talk about this phrase, the most high. Let's go back to our, uh, our verse here in verse 34. He says, but at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. A most amazing statement here. Actually, it's just Most High. We'll talk about that in a second. Alehi is the Aramaic phrase for the Most High, or Most High, really. This Aramaic phrase occurs 18 times in the Hebrew scriptures. This phrase only occurs in the book of Daniel. I find that to be very fascinating considering, um, again, there's between chapters two and seven, this is where it occurs here, this phrase, most high. The first occurrence is seen in Daniel three, verse 26, way back in the previous chapter, okay? which I will, I will read here. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire, 
And he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. So Alehi is where this word occurs, its first occurrence. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach came, came out of the blazing fire. Let's continue to talk about this word, Alehi. Within uh, the phrase within this book is only used of God who reveals mysteries and no other deity. That's pretty incredible because when we were looking at the Enuma Elish, even in the Enuma Elish, Marduk is not called the Most High. If you remember that, if not, go back and listen to that. Um, this phrase also connects back to Nebuchadnezzar's admission of the dream. He recalls in chapter four. Remember how Daniel explains to him, yeah, yeah, um, this is going to happen to you until you acknowledge that that the most high is the is is the is the is the one who gives you kingdoms, is the one who gives kingdoms and takes kingdoms away. Now, this is kind of fascinating. I want to kind of show you something here. This gives me an excuse to finally use the pen well. Um, so uh, uh, you can see that this is uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. On top, of course, you have the English translation, downwards you have uh, the Aramaic phrase. And of course, um, you have the parsing down below. Of course, we've done this before. Um, this right here, if you can see it, this is kind of this is kind of cool. This lament here. This is a direct object marker. We are very familiar with these because Ecclesiastes uses them all the time. OK, what is a direct object marker? Well, you see here, this is, uh, of course, uh, the verb here. OK, and a direct object marker essentially tells us what action that the subject is. At, what, what's it pointing to? So. Um, by the way, usually direct object markers are usually used in case there's some confusion about which uh, subject is doing which or which verb belongs to which subject. Well, that's confusing because there's only one subject here, right? I mean, I guess you can say that, that Nebuchadnezzar is the person who's speaking, but it's not associated with him. Why would you put a direct object marker in here? It doesn't need one, right? Why is that even important? Well, the reason is because the direct object marker, the blessing, you, uh, the bless in this sense is directed to the most high only, which means that Nebuchadnezzar is now switching sides. His blessing is directly to the most high. This isn't just like a, yeah, I bless you, God, and all these other gods too. That's not what's happening here. His praise, his blessing, is his favorable statement is directed to the most high. That Aleph there, when used with this word, is a definite article. That is incredible. This shows that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar in his psyche, right now, the God of heaven and earth is the only God that, is, that ought to be acknowledged. It's incredible. But even more incredible is this one here. It says, but at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. Who lives forever. Chahi is the Aramaic phrase here. It is very similar to he in Hebrew. Okay? This Aramaic word occurs one time, one time, one time in this text right here. There is uh, this phrase within this book 
is only used of the God who reveals mysteries. Ain't that something? It's not even used of Marduk. If you remember when we did the Enuma Elite. This phrase is written within this book is only used of the God who reveals mysteries and no other deity. As a matter of fact, there's a similar phrase found in another place in the book of Daniel. Now, this is Hebrew, but it's very similar. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, which we will get there um, sometime. That's if, uh, if the rapture doesn't happen. Um, let's go ahead and read Daniel 12 here. It says, I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, and he raised his right hand and his left towards heaven, right? And swore by him who lives forever. That it will be for a time, times, and half a time. As soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy, of, of the holy people, all these events will be completed or fulfilled. Right. So this man, we'll find out who this man is uh, in Daniel 12, basically spread out his hands and swore by him who lives forever. Of course, that person, again, is God, the living one. Right. Going back to our uh, our particular text here. So as I mentioned before, um, again, we have a direct object marker with the most high, right? So that tells us where the, where the direction or the object of the blessing, who's receiving it, in case anyone gets confused. But this is kind of cool, too. So we've got in him who lives over here, right? And then we have forever right here. But notice this here. That's a definite article, folks. Again, another definite article here. So him who lives thee forever? Well, that doesn't really make much sense, right? Um, if we were to translate that. But this is speaking about a quality, the quality of the one who lives. He lives perpetually, right? In other words, he wasn't created, right? He wasn't uh, 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 produced by another god, right? He is the one who lives, period. Okay? He's not the, the God who will be taken over by another God, such as like uh, Tiamat was a God, right? And was overtaken by Marduk. This is why Marduk gets to reign, right? Because he took down Tiamat, right? There ain't no Tiamat here. Okay? He's the only one who lives forever, and that is emphasized with this definite article here. This is incredible. I guess it's not so incredible. When you've been in the wilderness for seven years eating grass, you know, and then all of a sudden your reason returns after you acknowledge God, you know, you'd be pretty surprised too, I think. Forever is the word alam. 20 times it occurs in scripture, 18 times in the book of Daniel. Again, this Aramaic word corresponds with the Hebrew word olam, meaning forever, the ever, ever existing, eternal, perpetual. Okay. Again, this is an honorary statement for a ruler and his rule. It is also a word that is used of God in the endurance of his kingdom. If God, by nature, is, a, is all ever existing, forever, well, then that means that everything that he establishes, particularly the kingdom, is forever. And Nebuchadnezzar gets it. I think I've I think I brought this up before, but that's okay. So let's look at the importance of this statement here. As I mentioned before, Nebuchadnezzar has a complete worldview shift in his thinking. I cannot tell you how important this is. 
for a Babylonian Gentile king who rules over Babylon and all of the other nations surrounding him, he has a complete worldview shift. He is no longer worshiping Marduk. That is crazy. He's not just acknowledging that God is just the revealer of mysteries. That's not in his purview anymore. Or just a God who preserves one's life for death, just one of countless others. But he is the one who lives forever. That is incredible. Nebuchadnezzar had this backwards when he first encountered God. The reason why he's the revealer of mysteries and the life preserver, so to speak, is because he's God, period. Wow. And for a Gentile king to acknowledge this, it's incredible. We talked about, uh, again, going back to the Enuma Elish, okay, that Marduk is the holder of the beginning in the future. Remember that? He was, Marduk is the one who killed Tiamat. He is the holder of the beginning in the future. He's the one who establishes these things, right? Well, now he flips and recognizes that the God of heaven is the one who lives forever, perpetually. Now we get to the cool stuff. Well, not that this stuff isn't cool, but to continue on here, Nebuchadnezzar makes another startling admission. He goes, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures for generation to generation. This statement by Nebuchadnezzar is a very important one. Once more, again, Marduk, according to his prior perspective, was the ruler of or Lord of Kings. That was one of his titles, right? He was the Lord of Kings. Again, this goes back to what Nebuchadnezzar said considering his first dream, okay? That, that God is the one who will establish a kingdom that endures for eternity back in chapter two, okay? Now remember, we talked about the elements of a kingdom. This is not a this is not a you know mystical kingdom or a spiritual kingdom. We talked about this that when uh, Nebuchadnezzar says this, he is saying this with this perspective in mind that there are physical lands and territories. There's a ruler or rulers within the lands. There are subjects or citizens. There are customs and laws that govern this. When he says that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, this is the perspective that he has. It is physical, right? Just like Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is physical, right? There's a centralized capital. The city of Babylon is the capital of Babylon, where it's located. He recognizes this. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, again, this underscores uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's admission. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom with all of these qualities, all of these elements, which will never be destroyed. Of course it won't, because God is the one who lives perpetually. So everything that he establishes lives perpetually and continues and endures perpetually. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will not be dispossessed. It will not be transferred. It will not be given over to another person. Someone can't conquer it. And put an end to these kingdoms. This will be the kingdom that endures for ages. There, will be a nothing, there won't be one after it. And the ones before it will pale in comparison to this. But it itself will endure forever. Why? Because the God is the living God who endures forever. Once more, Nebuchadnezzar's statement about the God of heaven's everlasting kingdom is important for two reasons. 
It establishes that the God of heaven is the one who gives kingdoms and removes kingdoms from them. He didn't get this in chapter two. He certainly didn't get it in chapter three. Now he gets it. Implicitly, it is also an admission. See, this is why the culture is important. He's not just saying this because this is what it is. It's an admission that Marduk does not, did not, cannot, could not, all the nots, give the Babylonian kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar. It's impossible because he doesn't exist. If we go back to the tablet of Nebuchadnezzar and look at his praise, his admiration for Marduk. Remember, he writes the following, to Marduk, my Lord, I make supplication. O eternal prince, he doesn't think that now. Lord of all being, he certainly doesn't think that now. Guide in a straight path the king whom thou lovest and whose name thou hast proclaimed as was pleasing to thee. I am the prince, the favorite, the creature of thy hand. Thou hast created me and entrusted me with dominion over all people. He doesn't believe that now. You know, we sit here in Kansas City, Missouri, 2024. I don't, I know for me personally, looking at kind of Nebuchadnezzar's psyche and his history, I don't even think I grasp the importance of the statement that he's made. To be a Gentile king who has encountered the God of heaven like this and have a complete paradigm shift It almost kind of recalls Will's statement. Do we even do we know who we're dealing with? Right. I don't think that Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar, based upon his statement, understands that if the God of heaven establishes a kingdom, it cannot be undone. Since it is God, not Marduk, who gave him the authority to rule Babylon and have the influence that he had during the time of his reign. What an incredible admission. If we go back to the Enuma Elish and look at all of the titles, or at least some of them that are up here on the screen, if we go to the left side, that not only Marduk was the holder of beginning and the future, but he was the chief of all Lord and Kings. He was the one who establishes kingdoms, particularly that within Babylon, and the Lord of rulers. And since Marduk was the Lord of rulers and kings, he obviously was the one who established Babylon to be glorious and beautiful in the first place. But now Nebi's admission, Nebuchadnezzar and his being um, shown that Marduk doesn't exist and that Marduk cannot help him either. That the God of heaven is the chief of all lords or kings, which is essentially what he said here. And that the God of heaven establishes the kingdoms since he is the most high. The statement of Nebuchadnezzar, really, in verse 34, is an admission, an acknowledgement of what will take place in the future. And I'm convinced that Nebuchadnezzar will be there. I know we always worry about that. Is Nebuchadnezzar saved? Is not saved? Is going to be there? We're going to talk to him. I have no doubt that he will be there based upon just his speech and the emphasis. 
The kingdom that the God of heaven will establish will continue in perpetuity. That no person will be able to overthrow it. No or nor will it be passed on to another. The kingdom and its qualities will exist from one generation to the next. We will get to talk, I believe, to Nebuchadnezzar. We'll get to tell him, man, what was it like, man? Like crawling on the ground, man, for seven years? Bro, you got, you could, man, that's rough, bro. Right? And I'm sure he will be like, oh, but it's probably the best thing that ever happened. Nebuchadnezzar, due to the personal act of God concerning his life. This is not a prescription for us. This is for us to read and believe, okay? to be convinced of that God is the only God, period, right? Concerning his life and position, realize not only that the God of heaven holds all the power and the influence and gives it to whomever he chooses in this economy, that is the economy of law, but it is also an admission that Marduk and the Enuma Elish are not true. He just completely destroyed their mythology. Several thousand years of the Enuma Elish, I believe before, uh, um, 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 what was it? Um, oh my gosh, I can't remember the document. But it, it was way before uh, uh, when Babylon was just was just a small group of towns and cities and things like that before it, became, it coalesced into a kingdom. They believed this stuff. Nebuchadnezzar's dad was wrong. Think about that. His legacy is tarnished as a result of him turning his back on Marduk. There's that too. Marduk could not save him from the loss of his reason. Remember, who, what, what wrath, who can withstand, what God can withstand Marduk's wrath, right? And could not restore his kingdom to him. That is verse 34. Again, a small statement of Nebuchadnezzar, but tons of information that tells us a lawful lot about his mindset and his perspective, where he was during the time. He is no longer a follower of Marduk. It took him, what, 30 years to get there? Maybe a little more? But he got there right before his death. Praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this account. This account of Nebuchadnezzar, that he's a Gentile king who acknowledges that you are the God of men. And throughout this time, you've been incredibly patient as we've been reading through the text demonstrating yourself to him. And when you personally work with him by uh, removing his reason, his ability to think, he gets it. I thank you so much, Lord, for this account that you indeed are the King of heaven and the God who is the living one forever. For it's in your son's name.